from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 367, recorded live Thursday, April 11, 2013. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, makers of Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Christian Heilman about the new Firefox OS and the open mobile web. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm here in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand at the very first Angle Brackets conference. We've just come out of the keynote with Christian Heilman from Mozilla. How are you? I'm good. Rather tired, but other than good. <laughs> you are jet-setting all over the planet. Yes, and it's quite bizarre when you fly with Brit- with American Airlines that you have to always go through Dallas, no matter where you go. Yeah, it's a requirement. Yeah. It's part um, of America. You have to go through Dallas at every... Anytime you fly anywhere, you got to go through Dallas. Well, that's good to know. So now I know my way around the airport. <laughs> cool. So you, in your keynote, you talked about something called the Vanilla Web Diet. Yes. And I've I've heard of Vanilla JS, which is a, a a web library in air quotes that I talk about in my in my talks. Talk to me about the Vanilla Web Diet. Well, the Vanilla Web Diet was an idea that I originally wanted to bring out as a book, which I'm running out of time right now to do. But we'll see what we can do with it. It's probably going to be a chapter in another book. Um, I just find it that right now that we're uh, fleeing into abstraction a lot. We 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 have so many wonderful things in browsers, in newer browsers, and we could use all of that in a few lines of code. We can create lots and lots of effects, but instead of doing that, we just include five, 15 libraries and 12 different widgets so we can actually get that effect. And the reason is that we want to give the same effect to every browser out there. Mm-hmm. So with the Vanilla Web Diet, what I'm actually explaining is how to use web standards and how to use a progressive enhancement approach to make sure that newest browsers get the coolest, newest things in a fashion that doesn't actually uh, empty your battery or slow down your computer, and older browsers get things that just work. So instead of just building for the newest and then complaining that old browsers are out there, we just should build things that are based on HTML with some CSS and JavaScript on top and getting better and better according to what the hardware it's running on and what the browser it's run in can do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people forget this by now. I mean, when, I was, when, the, when we started on the web, we just had nothing else. We basically had to learn HTML to make it work. And nowadays, we just start with like different frameworks and we start with different build scripts and we have a lot of code that we don't know what it does. And to me, that sounds a bit dangerous in an environment where everything is just in time compiling and running in a browser that I can't control. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's wonderful to see that when you gave the, when I gave this talk this morning that people it's shocking to see, but at the same time interesting to see that you can inspire people by showing them an nth child selector in CSS, for example, that they've never used before because they've been told about three years ago that Internet Explorer so and so cannot run it, so they will never use it. Mm-hmm. People don't understand that the web is now changing every six weeks, so technologies are available to us if we just dare to use them and there's no way that you can actually build a new product that you say you're going to release next year Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't build it on the current state of technology but on the coming state of technology otherwise you will always build outdated material that just gets bigger and bigger the longer we go there that's where the diet thing comes in a lot of products start to grow because people don't know how to maintain them or maintainers just add more code onto it because they don't even want to look at the old stuff anymore. So from the very beginning, thinking lean makes better products. Mm-hmm. You know, I just literally two weeks ago pulled out some JavaScript. Uh, it was a jQuery call that looked at odd and even table rows and made them alternating colors. Yep. And I just looked at that and I was like, wait a second, I think we have that now. Yes. It's just it was almost like refactoring via subtraction, just pulling stuff out and saying, "Oh, we have that, we have that." So let me ask you this, should I feel guilty if I put jQuery in my website? No, you shouldn't. It's all about the use case of it. You should feel guilty if you use jQuery in a very wrong way. jQuery is a very powerful tool to access the DOM. Uh Anything to slow down a mobile interface is a lot of access to the DOM. So a lot of uh, a lot of jQuery looks short and looks very simple, but actually does horrible, horrible things to the browser under the hood. So uh, the usage of jQuery may make it a problem. 
making jQuery your start is actually not a bad idea because it actually gives you the uh, gives you the same across all devi- uh, across all, pl- all browsers. The issue that you have is as soon as you go into a mobile environment, then you might actually have realized that jQuery slows you down a lot, and it's another HTTP request. Your basically your functionality doesn't work until the library has loaded, and on a mobile device, this can be a crucial five seconds that will lose you a, a, an end user. Mm-hmm. Is it primarily the CSS selector that pr- is the value added by jQuery? Like it. It kind of puttied over, it spackled over all of these problems with early browsers. But now we can go and, and use CSS selectors. So do we even need it at all? I, I think it. Uh, the, what it did is actually it made it easier for uh, DOM access. It made it easier to use events because there was a lot of differences between browsers there as well. And it made it actually, uh, it had a different approach to web development. It basically said instead of just writing things and then writing code again, everything is about accessing the DOM and, and um, interacting with HTML elements. So that allowed people who don't know about programming at all to make animations, to make beautiful things uh, come from the side and go out from the the top but the issue with it is it that all of it is actually animated in javascript and all of it is actually generated for you so you don't know how to control it and right now when i do a uh, when i do an animation in javascript i actually do everything on the main processor which on a phone is slow but if i do a css animation i do it on the video chip which is actually much faster and doesn't drain as much battery so the main issue with that we that people learned from uh, from jquery is that interaction with the html and javascript should happen all the time when in reality you want to make that as few interactions as possible you just want to flush them out in one go but a lot of people just write jquery saying like do this change this, do this, change this, and force the browser to re-render every single time and reflow every single time. So a lot of bad, in, uh, badly lagging interfaces because people don't understand the impact that using those five lines or this plugin has. That's really interesting. Let's try to dig into that a little bit. So you're saying if I go and say, you know, dollar sign, and I, I always say open resig, and then <laughs> selector, and then close resig, uh, dot fade, fade in, that's a procedural animation. It's it's a it's a tight loop. Yes. Where I'm going to it's basically it's basically going to the element and changing the opacity on uh, with a set timeout every twenty milliseconds or something like that, or, or two hundred milliseconds or something like that. Whereas the browser doesn't render every two hundred milliseconds. It waits every time when there is a new uh, when there is a new f- uh, sixty frame or sixty hertz frame to be rendered. So. Um, what I'm working with with jQuery right now as well and jQuery 2 is thinking about this as well as using a request animation frame to make that animation better and also to test if CSS animations are available and then just generate a CNS, CSS animation on the fly rather than doing the procedural uh, direct access to the DOM and changing the element. Uh, uh, other other libraries like Zepto do that already. That's why they're used on mobile much more than jQuery is. Mm. So you think that we need to kind of remind ourselves or rediscover the web and a lot of the the declarative things that we can do. I mean, there's a whole bunch of power in CSS that will run on the graphics chip that will be friendlier, faster, smoother, better. We, we have much more to gain now by actually building things faster and smaller because the, the mobile web is there. People are using their tablets, people are using their uh, their mobile phones, and all of them are different. You cannot expect somebody to have the newest iPhone 5 and only run smoothly on that one. People have really rubbish older phones and like get phones handed down from their parents or their siblings. So uh, we have a whole new market out there that needs very performing uh, web products, and especially as people are saying like that that uh, uh, that native is better than the web, so we have to really be better than the, better than native by beating them in a market or in a way that they can't cover. So a, a web app can actually work on an iPhone, can work on an Android, can work on a tablet, can work on a desktop um, in HTML5. I have to build them natively for all the other platforms, and they can never be the same. They're much more fixed in the uh, in the specifications of the hardware and the specifications of the size of the screen. Whereas with the web, I actually have to build it uh, uh, flexible from the very start. We right now uh, uh, we, we just released Firefox OS, and that one is a 320 by 480 pixel phone that will be that will be sold in uh, two time i think the first one gets sold in poland and then we go to south america and other markets so we're actually bringing web connectivity on mobiles to markets that cannot afford iphones or androids and cannot get them they're also going to be uh, they're also going to be 
billing with the telephone bill so you don't need to have a credit card. So there's billions of new web users on mobile technology coming this year mm -hmm. to us, but we actually have to make that run on a one gigahertz machine with 256 meg of RAM. And we cannot do that if we just put 15 libraries in there and just look at things on a desktop and say like, well, that's smooth. It's got to be smooth everywhere, right? Mm, okay, so if I... You know, I have apps with 15 JavaScript files, and I have jQuery tight loops and things like that. If I bring this on a, on a lower-end phone, it's going to just be awful. It's going to be slow. It's going to be... It's going to be laggy. It's going to be... Uh, it might actually even break. I mean, like, if you look at Blackberries, for example, lower-end Blackberries, after a while, they when, when, a, when a certain uh, JavaScript takes too long to load, it just stops rendering. Well, there is a great talk about uh, about these kind of things, that a five-second rule that people stop after five seconds to actually reload your page rather than waiting for the loading on a mobile device and these kind of things. That's true. It's just, uh, it's, it's just incredible how much... How much less patient we are on a mobile device. I always love it when people go around with their maps and like, oh my god, it can't find me. And you're like, well, you're aware this goes to space for you and back. Yeah, this yeah. is science fiction in your pocket. Right. But we feel like we sh we paid so much money for that phone. We pay so much every month. We should get a better service. It's yeah. that uh, belief of we should get better from that. Have you seen that? You've seen the Lewis C.K. bit about how everything is amazing and no one is happy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I actually gave a keynote at HTML5 DevConf last week about this, where I shared, said that the web and native cannot be compared at all because native is based on the principle of built-in obsolescence, which was written in 1955, which basically was initi initiated by, back then in the Journal of Retailing, saying that the economy in America can only survive if we build products that break after a year. We have to keep people constantly buying new products, and products have to have to be outdated. And then they shifted it even further a year later. Where they said it's going to be, it's going to look outdated. It doesn't have to break, but it has to be. You have to feel not to be part of the cool in crowd if you don't have the newest product, and that's what all of advertising is around. And that's why native applications are actually built to sell the next level of hardware. It's not necessarily about the application itself. It's uh, it's a new cool game coming out that only runs on iPhone six, seven, eight. Will sell six, seven, eight, but people will not actually say uh, will not actually get it for the older devices, mm -hmm. and that's what really annoys me. Also, that they don't sync. I don't. I play Temple Run on my on my on my tablet and on my mobile phone, and I have to play it on both of them, and because they don't sync at all. I don't play Angry Birds anymore because I've got six versions of Angry Birds, and none of them know what level I'm on. Yeah, and I thought that was the promise of the cloud. Yeah, and I mean, like with native apps, it can't be because you you have the problem that you either go into a third party service like Score Loop or things like that, or uh, you just don't don't do the syncing because it is and uh, it is a binary code. It's it it cannot just sync with others. You, yeah, well, you have to run a backend service then and be responsible for that backend service and own that data and all those things. That's why things like Parse and mobile services exist. Well, that's general. I mean, uh, native apps are basically much harder to upgrade because you have to upgrade them as a whole bunch. Whereas of an HTML5 application, you can only upgrade the the parts that you want to upgrade. And to me, that makes a lot more sense to download like 20k over a, a connection than download 23 meg over a connection. I, I wrote a blog post that got some play last year where I said that apps and app stores feel like CD-ROMs did in the 90s, where you would, you know, something would be sent to you and you'd get the CD and then you'd go on and you'd download the patch for that CD and then you'd always have this update. You'd you know get like 600 megs of binary and then you'd have to get the patch for it like you go and get um, remember the seventh guest yeah right and you had to go get seventh guest 1.0.2 and make sure you have the latest this and the latest drivers and things like that 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 constant tension between native apps and web apps has been a, a frustration for me because i'm not sure what's right i mean sometimes it should be a native app like you know world of warcraft or i don't know maybe microsoft word but then you see something like word in the cloud and yeah. you go wow that's that's like 80% of Word. I mean, it's pretty much it. You know what I mean? Like the HTML5 version of Word and Excel look pretty fine. Yeah, we just released uh, uh, together with uh, uh, at the game show in San Francisco, we just ported the Unreal 3D engine to WebGL. And uh, that one is amazing. I mean, like, but it's only for desktop. It's not going to not gonna happen on any lap on any tablets anytime soon. Sure. But I totally love that you can convert C++ to JavaScript now because you cannot go to somebody like um, like uh, um, Electronic Arts and say like, hey, how about you write everything in HTML5 and fire those 20 C++ guys you have? Right. It's It makes much more sense to allow people a foot in the door and actually come in sideways into the web. And 
I think the 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 uh, the other description that I always find is like I remember like uh, uh, download.com or two cows or fresh meat and all of these look like <laughs> yeah. now look like shopping malls after the zombie attack there's like nothing in there is updated any longer and Well and the and the only way we can get people to download crap is by putting sidecar crap in that crap so like I recommended this DVD burner program Yeah. Because Windows 8 pulled the DVD burner out. So I said, oh, go get DVD Styler. And this worked great for six months. And then I start getting complaints from people who read my blog. And they're like, this installed a toolbar. And now it installs four toolbars and some spyware. And that the only wow. way that they can get, they can justify that model by, you know, because they're providing a useful third service, but no one wants to pay for it. Yeah. Is to put all of this evil. Uh, barnacles attached to it and download those. Isn't that part? That's part of the problem with the web as well, isn't it? I mean, so many people basically complain about ads being in stuff and they want they want it free at the same time. I mean, the money has to come from somewhere. Yeah. I like to pay for my stuff if I get good service. I mean, I use Pinboard for my links. I use Flickr. I use uh, Dropbox. I pay for GitHub. Mm -hmm. I, I I just don't want these things to go away because they're just too useful. Yeah. And if you don't pay for it, they will go away sooner or later. It's interesting that I find the uh, the closed market places exactly like that like the, the download.com and the two cows.com and things like that especially as they can pull content without asking you or saying like okay well here's your business model gone because your app is not available any longer right One really cool thing I found about uh, what we're doing in Firefox OS as well. This is not advertising. I'm just getting very excited about no, I know. this. No, what you're because about. That model needs to be broken. What mm -hmm. we have is a system called Dynamic App Search, which is getting a snazzier name sooner or later. It's basically you enter the name of a band and it shows you apps that have to do with that band. It shows you a video app. It shows you a music app. It shows you Wikipedia. It shows you a ticket app where you can buy tickets mm -hmm. and That way, we bring the use case to the app rather than the app to the use case. Right now, we spend millions of dollars making people in, in, in traditional advertising aware of what your app is called. It's the web. This thing is already crawlable. Mm -hmm. So why would we have to do that? Right. So with that dynamic app search, I can now enter, for example, U2. I find GrooveShark. I click on GrooveShark. I get the mobile interface, the mobile HTML face interface of GrooveShark. Mm -hmm. And listen to a song. When I like Groove Shark, I go back to the search results, do a long click on it, and then install it. And if they build the manifest file that we expect, then you actually pull all the offline data and you get the real full application rather than just the mobile view of it. So your mobile view becomes the uh, becomes the advertising for your app. And that's just how the web works. This is like uh, Yahoo's directory versus Google search. It's It's a natural conclusion that we have to come to. Okay, but let me let me push back and ask you this. Like when Google Web... When Chrome Web Store came out, everyone's like, this is it. This is it, the app store to end all app stores. And then people said, oh, this is just a bookmark. It's a bookmark. I have, like, even now I've got like, I don't know, I've got like random bookmarks to stuff. Like, you know, when I, when the Google Web Store came out, I hit control T and I installed, I installed. I'm saying that in quotes again, because I made a bookmark to, um, uh, Angry Birds, right? And it's still there, like on my browser, like four years later. It's a, it's a link to a website. No, it's, it is, but at the same time, if the app is written the right way, then you have the whole app cache going. You have a 50 meg in uh, index DB. You can put mm -hmm. everything offline. It's not just a bookmark. All of these things work on your, on your device then. And in Firefox OS, the benefit is that they can actually access the whole hardware as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got access to the vibration. You've got access to the accelerometer. You can take via pictures JavaScript APIs. via JavaScript okay. APIs, open standard app JavaScript APIs that also have been implemented in other browsers. But, but Google, web store, I don't know if it's fair to call it a failure, but it is fair to call it a pile of bookmarks. It is a pile of bookmarks because 1% of those apps has cash manifest and 1% of those uses hardware. And the rest of them are just bookmarks. Somebody threw together an app manifest, tossed it in the store to make a bookmark to their website. I think the problem there was that there was no interest in it because it was desktop apps. If, uh, if, if Chrome had been Android, And every phone would actually run these things. It would have been completely different. Mm. The, the 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 infight inside Google between Android and Chrome is very very annoying to me because I I don't think it's necessary. Uh, uh, it's 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 obvious that Android is is a great success and sure. Chrome has to battle that somehow. But I find it uh, I find it sad that it actually uh, that it actually became that way. And 
we had a few attempts to make that cross-browser and I really want it to be cross-browser. I don't have to, why would I install a Chrome app and need Chrome and then a Firefox app and need Firefox and right, then Opera right, and exactly. need an Opera app? It's an HTML5 app. We should be able to install this and run this from, on any of the browsers and get different access to the hardware according to what browsers allow us to do. Mm -hmm. But right now, we're, we're, we're still doing all our, lo our own little things because we want to keep the branding on there and selling people okay. our browser, I think. So to that point then, with my iPhone, when, when Firefox OS comes out, what will that mean to me? Will I be able to go into your store and get your apps? Yes, they, uh, you can install a lot of the apps, but I don't think you get access to the hardware because right. that's what Apple's uh, uh, terms and conditions don't allow us to do. We cannot run the Firefox engine on uh, on iOS, mm -hmm. and that's the big problem there. But it's open web, though, right? I mean, I should be able to get up to some point. I should yes, be able to get uh, a... you can. You can do the things that Safari can do, okay. and uh, uh, and all the things that Safari can do, and actually allows you to do is f are fine by that. But you don't get access to the vibration alarm. You don't get access to the things that we define these new web APIs. Mm -hmm. until Safari implements them which they're, which they're very much invited to do because Chrome and Opera are doing okay. and Microsoft are doing in some of them as well Battery API for example, geolocation mm -hmm. came from us as well so um, I think it's very important that people understand that uh, uh, that the browser choice should not be up for us I find it sad that, that uh, the iPhone went the way it went because uh, Steve Jobs was on stage and basically said like hey this is no SDK. You don't need an SDK. There's no native code. This is the web. Safari is the best browser out there. It does all the things. That was in 2007. Yeah, yeah. That was his first thing. He was like, this is the app store is the web. Yeah, and then basically uh, uh, he got pushed back from internally and from developers as well that basically n native developers were just like, oh, that's not good enough. Right. And I think we missed a big part there as the web community not to step into this and say like, well, thank you, here's what you do. But a lot of it was like, oh, this is just one browser. Mm -hmm. This will not work. So a lot of times the, the people that want to that wanna like the web or want to help the web are actually hurting it by being too close-minded about close products. So mm -hmm. Adobe are doing amazing stuff in HTML ml5 right now but a lot of people don't give them credit for it because it's adobe those are the guys that gave us flash yeah well exactly <laughs> you know? well and, and and i think everyone is suspicious of everyone like i'm hearing you say firefox os and i'm thinking okay cool there'll be some new low-end phones that will be really powerful and do some really cool stuff and i say powerful not by their raw power but by their ability okay and i'm like that's gonna be great more people with smartphones with color screens with html5 but then you're saying Firefox App Store and things like that, and I'm, I'm like, I'm a little suspicious. I'm like, what are you trying to do? Are you? Is this going to make everyone use your stuff? We needed an App Store uh, because people expect it. Okay. And partners wanted to have them on the phone as well. We got 18 different mobile partners. We got four different hardware partners that are releasing the phones with us. Mm, okay. And without a marketplace, they don't think it's a smartphone. In essence, if uh, the, the marketplace is built on another web API, it's another AP, uh, another JavaScript API that is mm -hmm. open, so partners can build their own web stores as well. But you can also install apps from your server, so you don't have to go through the market. Ah, okay, so you could just go to Hansman.com and get the yes, Firefox you, OS you put app. A, you put a manifest file in there, you put a JavaScript call on a button that says let's Moz install, point to the manifest file, mm -hmm. and then I can install it, both on Firefox OS and on Android devices that have Firefox installed. Ah. So basically, this is a this is a usable across the board, and that's what really gets me excited because waiting for a Firefox OS test phone was a right. long time, so I can test it on my Android as well. So you're sneak. I mean, let me put words in your mouth, and you tell me if I'm wrong. You're sneaking the open web past the carriers and past the handset makers in the guise of an app store. They're thinking, all right, cool, check app store, we got that. But in the process, they're going to have this great browser in HTML5 and the ability to do really anything on the open web. I think that's it, things like that are necessary. Like uh, uh, um, uh, we, we try to play in a market that thrives on being competitive and thrives on secrecy. Like everything in the mobile mobile market is about like patents and about like keeping your thing to yourself. That's why every phone provider had their own marketplace and failed with them three years ago. Mm -hmm. Vodafone in England was massive and like they paid lots of developers to build lots of apps that never saw the light of day. Right. And uh, I think we could go up there and like, basically preach from the uh, uh, from the tower and say like this is the web and everything is free and will be wonderful and nice to each other and nothing would happen. Right. Or we could give them what they want and at the same time make them realize that's there. The other main differentiator that we found was that our partners are not um, only just giving us the money or building our handsets, but they're actually writing the code. Mm -hmm. 
So from the very beginning, Boot to Gecko, the, the engine of Firefox OS, is based, was basically open source. So uh, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, and other partners have engineers on the project, full-time engineers that work with us in the system, mm -hmm. rather than just, just like, oh yeah, we like it, we put it on our phones, and mm -hmm. please give us new ones. So there's a much more of a vested interest. The other interesting bit is that there is carrier billing. So that was interesting for a lot of mobile providers. So basically, they can now get people uh, to buy apps on the telephone bill for the end of the month. So they don't need an extra credit card or market for that. So a lot That's of people nice. who don't have credit cards can now have apps the same way you can buy a SIM card with like $50 on it and give it to your kid. Right. And they can buy games for $50 and that's it. So there's no shock next morning when your credit card has been maxed out. In, uh, in, in South Africa and Zimbabwe, minutes are used as currency. Yep. And you can text someone and say, send me some minutes. And you can send a short code and say, I want to send this many minutes to this place. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. The ability to buy apps with minutes that you bought you know, with cash and you, you, you load it onto your phone is a really great idea. It's very creative what's happening in Africa in the mobile space, especially everything running on text messaging. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, we just think this is a dead technology. But, oh, my God, the micro landing stuff that's happening mm -hmm. down there is empowering so many people. It's just wonderful. Yeah, there's whole eBay-type barter systems done entirely on short codes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were talking about writing JavaScript that affects power. You mentioned that early on, almost as a throwaway comment. This idea that I could have a website that sucked my battery. Yes. And not even realize it. Yeah. Is there a way to let the user know that's happening? What if my favorite website, what if I went to, like, I go to theverge.com all the time. But if I learned the Verge was the problem with my iPhone's battery, I might not go there all the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, there's, um, huh. In terms of iPhone, I don't know, but where's our why slow? Yeah, developer you know? tools actually tell you that. I mean, you can just uh, 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 you can just navigate a battery is on in every browser right now that gives you the current state of the battery, how much it has this uh, has has stopped, and these kind of things. So you could write yourself a bookmarklet when you start the verge, and then after surfing for half an hour, and then realize just how much it actually sucked out of it and mm -hmm. what happened there. And developer tools in Chrome have lots and lots of ways to actually see where the performance goes, where the rendering goes. So there's detailed, detailed uh, screencasts out there about every single millisecond that's happening in your browser. And uh, uh, what we found in testing mm -hmm. a lot was basically that uh, social plugins and like Facebook like button things and these kind of things are the ones that suck a lot of battery life out of the out of the thing because it's just constantly trying to load new comments and things like that in the background. And it's just very annoying because these could just be links, like mm. just putting extra uh, uh, JavaScript libraries in there just to say, I want to like this on Facebook or send a Twitter there. And you're like, I can copy and paste URLs. It's not hard to do right <laughs> you know it's funny um this is not uh, thinking about constrained i think about constrained bandwidth and slow machines and we think about overseas and we think about non-western countries but my my brother lives in the country yeah okay he lives on a farm and he has an old computer and he has a 3g modem he has no he has, it's the closest thing to having dial-up and there's still a lot yeah. of dial-up in the in the u.s and he only has five gigs a month and he kept bumping up against it Yes. Every month, and he couldn't figure out why. And it's like I'm paying for that extra ten bucks at the end of every month, and I don't know why. So we put on Flash Block and Ad Block in uh, in the browser in Firefox, and I figured it would it would buy him that extra couple hundred megs that was going to get him to the end of the month without paying. It cut his traffic in half. Yep, the ads were more than you know were half to more than half of the traffic that he was pushing around. And I can only imagine. He said, and he says, "It's so much faster now." Yeah, it's so much faster now. Lord knows what those ads are doing. It's sad that we have to cheat it, though, isn't it? Shouldn't we be clever enough to have ad systems that don't drain batteries and actually make the web slower? I mean, Google did a good job with their uh, uh, with their updating their Google Analytics to be deferred and everything, so that's yeah. much better now than it was before. Mm -hmm. But when I did security audits of uh, of ad code when I worked in Yahoo, it's just horrible, horrible code for the reason that it has to work everywhere. Mm -hmm. They jump through hoops in every single line of their code right. to actually make it work in Netscape. Escape four on a on an old Windows NT machine and things like that, mm -hmm. and it's just uh, I think it's just um, uh, it's time to revamp the whole idea of ads on the web, especially thinking about responsive design and having fixed ad sizes is just not working together at all. Mm -hmm. 
and actually, we're we're all over in this podcast. This is great fun. I'm <laughs> uh, thinking about responsive uh, responsive design. You we talked a little bit at the beginning about the idea that JavaScript libraries uh, bring a lot of weight with them, and that we might want to get back to the basics and really understand what's happening in JavaScript. The same thing applies to CSS. I, I wanted to to go and put. Just if you're for this show, actually, for people who are listening who haven't visited the site lately, go to hanselminutes.com and go to archives. There's faces of all of the people now. And I said to myself, oh, I'll go get uh, masonry or I'll go get this CSS or that CSS. And I started looking at it and I was like, do I really need 20K of CSS and a grid system to put a bunch of faces and boxes in a responsive way? And I realized that if I don't know what's going on, yes, I do need that. Yes. It's all about knowing what you do. And uh, I remember it was wonderful at the Ajax, uh, uh, at Media Ajax in London years and years ago, there was uh, Dion Almayer and Ben Galbraith were, were giving the keynote and they were talking about the grid uh, view of YouTube, I think. And they were actually saying like, okay, and we need a JavaScript for this because CSS can't do that. And I was a cocky young person back then. So I basically, uh, during their keynote, I wrote a CSS example to do exactly that and showed it as the first slide of my talk. Oh, ouch. So, um, <laughs> And that made me. That made them actually contact me, and I became a blogger for Ajaxian with them because of that. Wow! But yeah, it's it's really. I think it's about collaboration as well. If it's we we uh, as developers, we're prone to try to do everything ourselves rather than just partnering with somebody who cares. Like if I don't have feel much love for for CSS, then don't do CSS. Partner with somebody who loves CSS, and you're both gonna do something really, really good together, rather than doing something half baked on your own. Yeah. But instead, what we do is we go to Twitter and complain that CSS is broken because we don't want to understand it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I I really knew what I wanted my new my new website to look like, and I re just relaunched the redesign. But I knew I didn't have the CSS skills to do it, and I could try and fake it, or I hire a designer. I, well, it's also a matter of like how much traffic you have, how much how much will you actually, what your audience is. I mean, that's a podcast for web developers. So you can expect a lot of things from your audience already. Oh, absolutely. So it's it's very it fascinates me when you see a lot of performance uh, talks or performance blog posts that say like, oh, this is very important for the Gmail interface, and you're like. That's good, but that doesn't apply to my blog. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, uh, our performance things and our optimization things are always for d depending on the use case and depending on the context. Mm -hmm. And we're we're very prone to throw out truisms right now and yeah. say like everybody has to do this. I was at EdgeConf in London and we talked about a lot of like uh, uh, performance things and that was about really bleeding edge stuff. And the Chrome team was there with all my friends from the Chrome team. And every single answer more or less was like, oh, the Chrome DevTools can do that. Of and I'm like, yes, they can. But at the same time, you cannot tell me that I can test the performance of a web view in iOS with the developer tools in Chrome because they cannot reach it. So <laughs> there is no one solution for everything. You should look at Glimpse. Have you ever heard of the Glimpse tools? No. So Glimpse... Glimpse uh, is a is a imagine the web tools as a, implemented entirely in in jQuery and JavaScript, and okay. and so you you um, you add some JavaScript to your site, you hit the site, and then this this it looks like you know, people look at it and they go, oh look, it's F twelve tools. No, it's actually a, a div, and then the way that you connect it to the iPhone is you uh, type in a bookmarklet and you put in a collaboration ID. Mm -hmm. So you say, you know, set cookie, whatever, and you put in, uh, you know, foo. And then on the, on the desktop browser, you have the same collaboration ID. So you basically remotely connect to that instance. Okay. And then the JavaScript on, uh, the iPhone is sending all of that information back to the server and then bringing it back up into the desktop. There's still a bit of latency in there. No, there is, there is latency, but it's just this idea that, that you collect all the information on the, on the, on the remote device, on the tiny device, and then you display all that tracing information on yeah. the. I mean, client. that's a tricky thing for developers anyways. Isn't Somebody's got to solve it. Isn't it nowadays? I mean, have you heard about the uh, Open Device Labs and LabUp? No, what's that? It's gorgeous. It's basically a, a new foundation that a few people in Adobe and other pro other parties have started. And we have one running in, Mo in Mozilla in London. It's basically where we collect hardware and developers can come in and actually test their things on different phones and different platforms. Oh, that's awesome. And we're partnering with uh, different hardware providers to actually donate us hardware and uh, give a, have a, like, a secure lock and everything so your hardware just doesn't get like collected and sure, gets sure. lost and uh, people can just basically send emails in and say like I want to come along for an hour and test my app on these different devices which is perfect for freelancers
businesses and people that cannot afford all the devices that they want to test on. So there's a whole new movement called uh, Open Device Labs, and it's going to get big. There's a few in Berlin, there's a few in San Francisco, there's a few in London, and I think it's like 37 worldwide by now. That's great. I think every city would want that. I love that idea because it's just uh, I feel it feels silly that as a developer I have to buy all this hardware. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I know people. I think we've seen these Adobe examples where they have everything synchronized and the guy's got twelve devices. And yeah, we've seen pictures. Adobe of, Shadow, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see like John Resig and like here's the work we're doing on jQuery Mobile and he's got like fifty phones all and that's a lot of work. Yeah, not everyone can do that. Let me ask you one last thing, uh, just because it's a something that I had to deal with lately and I solved it with jQuery and now you're making me feel like I'm a bad person. <laughs> On the on the archives, there's 360 shows, and I wanted to present them as an infinite list, mm-hmm. or at least a list that goes 100 to 360. And uh, I went and I got all the faces, and I made the grid, and everything's great, and it's responsive. And I put it up, and then I got a bill from my cloud provider saying that I was pushing too much traffic. And I forgot that I was pushing out basically 8 megabytes of images every time someone hit the page, okay. regardless of whether they looked at all of the images. So I... I, I said, I wish that low source existed still, like image low source. Well, so it, I, it does. With a data attribute, you can fake so it. So I went yeah. and did data dash source, yeah. and I faked it, and I used jQuery lazy load. Yeah. And then I wanted uh, I wanted l- sorting and filtering. So I put in list.js and then had to fight with list.js and the events w- and uh, lazy load because what was happening was lazy load will, will show things on the scroll event if they enter the viewport. Mm-hmm. But ListJS filters things and brings them into the viewport with no event firing at all. Mm-hmm. So all of these gray squares would hop to the top. But the point is that what I wanted was don't go and get these images if no one's ever going to look at them. Like that business problem yeah. seemed simple. Don't show me an image unless it enters the viewport. Yeah. Why I had an image loader for that for a long, long time now, yeah. and a lot of a lot of things have that. I'm very wary about things that do things on scroll because they don't perform well on uh, on tablets okay. a lot. Um, and I, I think, I mean, you've done the right thing because you would used the tools that you had, and it basically it works. It's that's fine. But it's a, it's a great solution that works perfectly that I feel guilty about. Yes, but that's okay. I mean, like it it can happen. Sometimes you have to you have to bite the bullet. In your case, what I would do instead is just use uh, uh, use local storage and index db to store that images. Oh, okay. If so, you use something like uh, if you use index db on uh, on Chrome and uh, Firefox or Web SQL, I think on others, there's a great library. <laughs> funnily enough, a library, but it's course. a really small one called Launcher. Yeah, Launcher. And if you use Launcher and you basically you store these images in uh, in uh, in index db or uh, on these but things, why wouldn't I do some long caching or use the web itself? Like, isn't the web supposed to be smart about these things? Yeah, you can do that as well. If you do a, if you do a long expire on the images, it should do the same thing. But if you have them in a, in a, in a database, then you can upgrade them and you're actually actually in control of which ones is actually being changed. See, I feel like you're saying reject the web and then roll my own database caching system for images. No, because you already want you if you want control over the images then yes. If you don't then if you don't care if you think like as long as they're cached I'm good, mm. that's fine. But what if one of these images when one of the speakers says like I look horrible on this one and I now change gender, yeah. can you please change my image? I can't can it control F5. Yeah, but you can <laughs> but you can't you really do that on the web that easily yeah. instead of having it in a database. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today. You're welcome. Uh, you'll put up. We'll put up links to the Vanilla Web Diet and uh, Christian on uh, Twitter and his blog as well. And you can learn all about uh, the new Firefox OS. Lovely. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.